In today's video, we're going to be discussing a potential trade involving the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Los Angeles Kings. We have an update on the situation uh, involving the contract negotiations for Shane Pinto and the Ottawa Senators. Rookie camps are well underway, and we also have a fairly substantial update as well on the Mike Babcock investigation that's ongoing. All that and more coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a variety of things to take a look at today. Uh, first up, I just want to start with a very quick note on a uh, signing. Uh, we have a signing in uh, a former NHL player going overseas to play in the KHL, and that's Josh Levo. Uh, Levo has played most recently in St. Louis, Carolina. I uh, used to be with the Leafs, of course. Um, he is heading overseas. Uh, apparently, there was some talk he may uh, take a, a PTO in the NHL, but he's opted to go for the, I guess, the more guaranteed contract which certainly makes sense from a you know financial perspective on his end so josh levo will not be playing in the nhl this year we'll see if he ever uh, makes his return as i mentioned rookie camps are well underway uh, official training camps for everybody start next week players will be reporting on wednesday uh, thursday will be the first day on the ice for most teams as well uh, but rookie camps there's lots of rookie games going on uh, today as well a bunch this afternoon some this evening so it's great to see actual hockey you can watch most of the rookie tournament or showcase games are, are live streamed between um, the team's social media websites and YouTube and stuff so certainly take a look and uh, see if you can have a chance to watch some of the action I know all kinds of great rookies uh, being showcased here by other teams and the, the brief rookie camp so it didn't last too long but still you get a few days of some action to see how these guys match up you know team to team so gives you a little bit of a glimpse into the future as I mentioned as well we have another fairly substantial update regarding the Mike Babcock investigation, the whole situation there that's gone going with uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets. Now, the NHLPA, we did know, just to give you a quick update on where things were at the last time we talked about it, was that the NHLPA was sending its uh, representatives, including Executive Director Marty Walsh and Ron Hainsey and uh, potentially others, to Columbus to meet with several Little Jackets players. I assume they may have spoken to, I don't know if they talked to Babcock himself or not. I know he was actually in, I believe, Traverse City for the Jackets rookie stuff that was going on. So I don't know if they actually spoke to him directly, but they were certainly meeting with a variety of Jackets players. And they were also uh, connecting with several players who have dealt with Mike Babcock in the past. I think they're trying to kind of determine not only what transpired here now with the current situation, but what does his history dictate and what was he you know, doing before? Because there's a lot of people that have said that this is not a new exercise for Babcock, that for him to, you know, kind of go through a player's phone, not necessarily in a, you know, the way, I guess we'll see what comes out of the investigation, but the way it was portrayed is almost like he wanted to go through players' phones and kind of, you know, snoop through their life. It's kind of the way it was portrayed when Paul Bazinet first broke the story. But based on what Babcock has said and some of the other players, it sounds like it was more of a open invitation to, hey, I want to get to know you better. Do you mind sharing type of approach and looking at like, you know, family pictures to get to know them and all that kind of stuff. Clearly, some players were more than fine with it, uh, which appear to be some of the older veteran guys. But as Elliot Friedman reported yesterday, some of the younger players or at least at least one for sure, because somebody obviously had to complain that they were not comfortable with it. So we don't know what's going on exactly, but the NHLPA was in Columbus yesterday, did a bunch of investigating. There was a league meeting today between the NHL and the PA that was pre-scheduled. The Bamcock situation, I think, did take up a lot of the agenda, but it was already a pre-scheduled meeting, so it's not like they were meeting just because of this, but it did dominate their, uh, their meeting time, I'm sure. But the statement came out earlier from the NHLPA, and this is what it says. The NHLPA officials, Marty Walsh, Ron Hainsey, and Don Zavello uh, met with the NHL earlier today at the League New York City office regarding the matter involving Mike Babcock. During the meeting, we provided the NHL with an update on our ongoing review. We do not have any further comment at this time. Now, based on what NHL reporters were saying, they wondered if we might get some clarity today. I know Friedman talked about it. Darren Dreger reported on it. Chris Johnson, they were all kind of you know, optimistic and hoping maybe we'd get some clarity on what's going to happen today. But 
We did not. We only got this statement. But to me, the key part here is the fact that the NHLPA has provided the info that they found so far to the NHL. And the key word of that whole statement to me is ongoing. That tells me it's likely not over. That word in belief is that they're still continuing to meet with people and still trying to uh, discover more about this situation and, and the past of Babcock and what's transpired before. So uh, we will see. I, I would hope for everybody's sake and involved here that they obviously don't take too long to kind of come to some conclusions. Clearly training camps are about to open. If they decided to let him go, that would put the team in an awfully awkward position right before camp starts. But hey, if it's the right thing to do and it's the best decision, then so be it, I guess. But it just it's it's not looking good. I would think that, and many of the reporters were saying this too, that Columbus ownership has got to be not happy right now. Uh, I would think that if it turns out that they have to let go of Babcock, I wonder if GM Yermo Kekalainen is going to be in trouble here because ultimately he's responsible for that decision to hire him. And obviously he's brought on, you know, this situation uh, in a sense that, you know, knowing that this is a risky hire and that everything Babcock does is going to be scrutinized. There's no doubt about that. Um, So we will see where this goes. We don't know. I don't know if we'll get any more clarity over the course of the weekend or if it'll drag into next week or, or what have you. But certainly... It sounds like it's not over, and it's ongoing. So we will see what comes from it. But it's certainly going to be probably the dominant story in hockey headlines here over the next few days until we kind of know some of the outcome. Now, we do have some updates to talk about as well involving the Ottawa Senators and the um, unsigned youngster Shane Pinto. Now, of course, uh, Elliot Friedman touched on this on his recent podcast that came out today, 32 Thoughts, um, with an update. And essentially, uh, right now what he's saying is that the Senators are still very much want to sign him. They're hoping to get it done. It sounds like talks have ramped up and picked up here recently. But, of course, the Sens are in an awkward salary cap position. For the first time in a long time, they're right up against the cap. They're trying to free up some space to allocate more money and a Pinto offer. But clearly that's a challenge right now. So like we talked about before in the last like a day, or I believe it was yesterday, with the Josh Bailey PTO, I'm wondering if that's, you know, he can play on your third line. He's a good defensive player. I wonder if that's a signal that maybe they're trying to trade somebody else like a Matthew Joseph who filled a similar role before, and they could get Bailey to do the same job at a much lower pay scale, with freeing up the money to sign Pinto and Bailey himself as well. That might be what uh, might be transpiring here behind the scenes. Only time will tell. However, what Freeman said as far as the trade talk around Pinto is believed that you know the Sens really don't want to trade him. And that's not their intent here whatsoever. The intent is to sign him. But because he's not signed and he can't be offer sheeted as well, he's not eligible for an offer sheet because he didn't have enough games played uh, to qualify for that. He's on a full um, restricted free agent in that sense. So, but at the same time, though, because he's not under contract, he is still technically able to speak to other teams. He just can't sign anything. And so Ottawa will have first dibs on everything here. But at the end of the day, teams are watching all these situations. You look around the league, you look at all the players that are not signed and the young RFAs. And teams are going to be getting calls going, hey, what's going on with this player? Are, if you're having a hard time signing him, have you thought about moving him? Here's what I'd be interested in. And it's just preliminary calls. He, Freeman believes that the Bruins and the Flyers were both teams that inquired with Ottawa. Um, I would suspect that if Ottawa got to the point that they felt like they needed to move him, that he they would prefer not to trade him to Boston, uh, obviously to help a division rival. But anytime a, a centerman comes available, especially a younger one, the Bruins are going to be all over that. That's for sure, based on their center depth after losing Bergeron and Krejci last year. So at this point, teams are calling. They're interested. Clearly, he's a good young player that teams could you know, see as being a part of their future. But the Sens don't really have that intent as of yet. Uh, some feel if they did have to move him, Ridley Gregg, who's coming along, could be an excellent replacement. And at the same time, though, I, I, I think the Sens would rather have both of them if they could, even if they can't keep both of them forever because as the time goes on, you get more and more players that become good and graduate out of their rookie contracts and earn raises. It's tough to keep everybody in the salary cap era, as we know, but you could have them both for at least a few years while they're on their rookie deals uh, would be uh, you know, preferable. So we'll see. Right now, things are still trending towards a signing taking place, but teams are calling, and uh, we haven't gotten to the point that Ottawa is really seriously 
entertaining anything as of yet. Now, as I mentioned as well, could we see a trade between the Leafs and the Kings? There's uh, some rumors floating through the uh, rumor mill here about the two teams maybe hooking up, involving a couple young players on getting them a change of scenery and getting each team a different type of prospect. So that trade would involve sending uh, Leaf prospect Nick Robertson to Los Angeles for Kings prospect Alex Turcott. Of course, Nick Robertson, we know, is known for having a really good shot, has battled a lot of injuries, um, has a hard time you know staying in the Leafs lineup when he's had opportunities but you know he's had kind of little small flashes of of uh you know success that looked like okay this guy's gonna be a good player he's gonna stick around but then it seemed like the few times he's had that something's always kind of come up the derail things but you know it's hard to say really looking at the Leafs lineup now after bringing in Domi and Bertuzzi and the emergence of Matthew Nyes at the end of the year it's it's tough to see a, a roster spot for him right now of course he missed a lot of time last year with a serious injury and you know maybe it's time to uh, to help get you know, some different depth in the organization. So the the whole thought process here is the Kings obviously have enough, more than enough centermen. They could afford to part with Turcotte and they would prefer, you know, maybe getting back a defense or a, a winger, sorry, like Robertson. Of course, Robertson's from California. So I'm sure he'd be thrilled playing in his home state. Um, you know, Turcotte, like I said, was the fifth overall pick in 2019 and only has 12 NHL games on his resume so far with no points. So clearly there's been, you know, some stuff going on with his development. He has played a ton in the American Hockey League, 91 American Hockey League games with 56 points. That's he's not like he's, you know, blown out of the water here, but he uh, that's decent results for sure. I think the whole uh, kind of problem, if you want to will, or setback to me for Turcotte, he has dealt with some injuries, but he only played one year of college hockey at the University of Wisconsin. I think he would have been better served to stay a little bit longer. At least one more year in college would have been good. Um, but, you know, he opted to sign early. The Kings obviously were a part of that, so they're, I think, just as much at fault here. But at this point, Turcotte, I wouldn't say he's a bust. I know some people call him that uh, because he was drafted so highly. But another year or two goes by and without really, you know, any more serious big steps forward, we're going to get to that point. Um, so we'll see what happens. But certainly a case of Turcotte being a, a centerman uh, who could, you know, obviously look at the Leafs. They've got Matthews. They've got Tavares. Um, you know, they got David Kampf as their number three. But, like, you know, in the next year or two, especially, uh, especially as the Tavares contract comes to an end, you know, they, they would probably prefer to have – uh, a couple of young centermen ready to kind of take the reins here and move up into that lineup. So it, it does make some sense from that perspective. Like I said, you also have a hard time finding a spot for Robertson in the current lineup after all the offseason moves they made. And maybe this would be great for both sides of the equation here. So I personally feel the deal does make some sense. It may not be perfect. It may not happen. But there is a lot of talk that both sides could benefit from this. Uh, say I've seen it popping up in the room reel over the last couple of days. So I'd just like to see what everybody thinks. Is this a trade that Toronto and LA should definitely pursue? Do you think there's a good advantage for both sides to get these players a fresh start and uh, kind of change up what kind of prospect they have and what kind of depth they have in their forward group? Let me know your thoughts on all today's news and rumors down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the latest news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.